Want to better understand yourself, others, and the best path for your life? Welcome to Authentic Living, podcast for a better life. The podcast where we delve into life themes and how learning who you authentically are can change your entire life. Here are your hosts, John Boris and Kim Ely. Hi, so welcome back to another episode of Authentic Living, the podcast for a better life. And you're with me, your co-host, Kim Ely, and also with co-host John Boris. And I'm really excited because today we're going to talk about an important topic. And I love this because it really is an eye opener. It's the impact that archetypes can have on families. Now to do a little recap, Authentic Systems, which is the awesome program that you developed, John, is yeah. based on four archetypes, love, justice, wisdom, and power. And what these archetypes are, are who we really are beneath our personalities. And I became interested in this through my book, Tickers, because I interviewed amazing people who followed their true North Star and decided to do what they wanted to do, no matter what anybody else told them, right? So, John, tell us a little bit about these archetypes and their impact. Well, I'll give you an example of a family that I worked with. There was a family of five, and there was a young man about 25, and he was the black sheep of the family. Mm-hmm. He was involved in alcohol, scarification. Oh. Uh, he had in drugs, and he had tried to commit suicide twice. Oh, no. And I had assessed the rest of the family, and it worked out very nicely, but but they kind of avoided him. But in the very end, I insisted that I at least like to try. Right. And so when I, what I did is I interviewed him. That's the, the assessment. And so I asked him, what makes you most happy? And he said, well, my, currently, my, I, I'm working in a restaurant, and mm-hmm. my friend was about to lose the restaurant, and he really needed help. So I decided Mm to uh, help him out and not take any wages and see if I can get him off the feet, on his feet. So the other one was uh, even bigger is he was 19 when he went to Haiti on a mission, a rescue mission for the people who had suffered from a hurricane. Mm. And that's at 19. Mm -hmm. What were we doing at 19? I was going to school. I was thinking about dating. You know, I certainly wasn't thinking of of going out and rescuing people. Oh, gosh, no. (laughs) And so what I did is I I asked him further questions about this idea of rescue and come to find out that's exactly what his, what I call the synthetic facilitator is. That (laughs) is, what are you really up to, the final result in your life? What are you up to? Mm -hmm. And for him, it was pragmatic rescue, but Mm -hmm. a radical form. And the re- rescue, he rescues everyone everywhere. And that's mm-hmm. what really gives him life and a sense of wholeness. And so once he became aware, in a sense, you find out your authentic identity is your job. This is what you need mm-hmm. to do. This is what you need to express. Mm-hmm. And so once he got that, there's a, many things that happen. One, he can control it. He could define mm-hmm. it. He knows what it's all about. He can look at his behavior and know what the true intention is. Mm-hmm. And it, it opens up everything. But more importantly, it validates my one statement. I always say to my clients, which is maybe there's nothing to fix, only something to be aware of. Mm. Once he became aware of this, everything fell together. And when our session was done, he went out in the car and his mother had come by and pick him up. And the following week, they both showed up mm-hmm. and the mother spent an hour. I mean, they were both crying uh, about how he had changed. He had, was not allowed to be in the house. According to the father, he was let in. He found a, a job helping other people. He signed up for uh, UNICEF. Oh, uh, and that's the last I heard of him was mm-hmm. he was in UNICEF and going back down into the Haiti area. And wow. that was it. His whole idea of rescue. And so all of that other problems that were engaged, the whole family was engaged with, was gone. Wow. That's what the report is gone. And now they understand what he's up to as much as he understands himself. Mm-hmm. 
And so the, this is the point. And I, when I just made this discovery, I had chills. Mm -hmm. it's not, so <laughs> if he doesn't have a victim, mm -hmm. he will make himself a victim. Oh, wow. Yes. Holy cow. So was that what was causing him then to be in such strife and to even try to That's commit right. suicide? That's right. Wow. So he had no one to one to rescue, so he had to rescue himself. In order to do that, he had to make himself a, a victim. When he saw that, everything opened up. Oh my goodness. So before he worked with you, what was the dynamic like with his family? I guess I'm thinking of what, what were they telling him? What sort of things were, was he focused well, on? Well, it was classic. It's, uh, it's uh, first of all, uh, because of all his uh, drinking and drugs, et cetera, they just didn't want him in the house. And mm -hmm. they had kicked him out and they didn't want anything to do with him. Mm -hmm. And that's also his brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And they thought, and they told him, you need to get a job. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, I like helping people. That's fine, but you can't make any money in it. Ah, uh, so that was the message his family had. I, well, you yeah. can't make money helping people. That's right. That's right. So, uh, so, that was, so that's what started it. And that, that is very common. Mm -hmm. The clients that come to me have gone through many self-help courses and seminars and workshops, mm -hmm. and they still feel a void. And the reason why is because they're following their parents. Parents, good-natured parents with good, yeah. good ideas, say, yeah. look, go get a job making money. Well, there's a lot of jobs out there to make money, and it's, it's not for them. Right. And it doesn't comply with their authentic identity. And right. when that doesn't happen, they have to live an inauthentic life. Right. Sort of show up. Gotcha. Wow. So just to kind of recap, so I make sure I understand. So this poor guy is getting messages saying you need to do something that makes money and right. helping people does not make money. Right. So he had pretty much adopted this idea, right? Like, Oh, I can't, I can't help people to make money. So he turned it inwards on right. himself. Right. Wow. It's also the power of the authentic expression. Mm. The power is it needs to be expressed. Now, had they, what I mean by uh, they couldn't make any money helping others, mm -hmm. he would he would help someone out in a restaurant mm -hmm. and not get and not get paid. Uh, uh, he would go to someone's house and help them clean up and not get paid. Someone would move, need help, and he wouldn't get paid. And he spent all of this time doing that and just part time here and there, and maybe a gas station or a, a restaurant, washing dishes, whatever it might be. But where he really put his time is helping others. Mm -hmm. So once they understood that, well, wait a minute, there is a way to make a living helping others. Right, right. And so let's go find what that is. And so that opened up another door. Right. And so that's something he hadn't considered. And he had the way to, to resolve that issue. Uh, he was young and he needed some help and guidance. And so his family gave it to him. Right. And, and, and last I heard, he was working for UNICEF and he's doing fine. Fantastic. So I'm really curious, John, because I found this so fascinating with family dynamics. And you know, as well as I do, as you stated, well-meaning parents will be like, you know, honey, you should really go into blah, blah, blah. That's where the money is. You know, you should become a doctor. You know, you hear that <laughs> frequently. And often do you find with families that there's certain archetypes that potentially clash. Like we were talking about the love, justice, wisdom, and power. I'm curious, do you, do you remember what the archetypes were for this gentleman's parents? Well, they were, they were both justice, as I recall. Ah, gotcha. So, so the problem they had is he was key, was it out of balance ah. as far as they were concerned. Mm -hmm. And it was all his fault as far as they were concerned. Oh, wow. So they were yeah. pointing the fingers at him like, no, yeah. honey, you're the problem. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so now all that did is compound the problem because he didn't know what he was being natural and yeah. he really didn't know what to do about it. Wow. Uh, but once they'd made that discovery that this is who he is, keep in mind, I uh -huh. had assessed the rest of the family. Ah, gotcha. They all knew about authentic systems. And ah. so they wanted to know. How does he fit in? Or if he does, or 
how will he relate? How can we relate better to him? So once I do a family, they actually speak in authentic language, you might say. Uh, right. They understand what they like, what they don't like. When you have conflict, they realize that they're not in conflict, but it's their archetypes. Gotcha. Okay? So okay. I'll give you a good example. I yeah. have ladies' uh, power, and mm -hmm. uh, the gentleman is justice. Mm -hmm. So what happens is the power wants to exert her opinion, her attitude, and have control. And so the, the justice guy, uh, he has a real problem with that because mm -hmm. that's, it's not about it's not about one size fits all. Right. And it, it's not about me complying with your wishes. Right. I have my own. And so they're always uh, having a problem. But once I assess them, they realize that the power and justice complement each other if they just look for it because they were with each other for a reason. Right. And so once they saw that, then everything was fine. Everything melted together. Oh, that's fantastic. But they I, that's, have to know that, yeah. Oh, yeah, they have to know that, right. It, it, yeah. that, that's key. Um, now, love and power does not get along. <laughs> they, does not. Well, like oil and water huh <laughs> and gotcha. because the power is very practical mm -hmm. wants results mm -hmm. and usually uh, physically oriented mm -hmm. whereas the love person can be physically oriented or uh, usually abstract mm -hmm. so now you've got a real conflict uh, yeah. one's looking for abstract result the other physical result they're not communicating one is for action getting things done and leaving uh, emotion and feeling out of it. Right. Trying to be more objective. Mm -hmm. and, but the love person is, no, this is about humanity and caring and, and uh, uh, this is what I'm up to. Mm -hmm. And so the two of them get into a lot of trouble. Mm. Oh, I can imagine. Now, wisdom and justice can too, if the justice is, of course, a combination of the caring and the wisdom. But if the mm -hmm. caring is too large, in their life, in the justice life, then the wisdom is not going to get along with them either. And the wisdom and love on an intimate relationship usually don't get along together. Gotcha. Gotcha. Speaking and thinking of the, of the young man, and he finally did, you said, found a job with um, UNICEF. Huh? So what do you think when, uh, of the statement, you know, do what you love and the money will follow? That's a very good statement. The problem you have is people usually don't know what that is. Ah. Uh, they they have they know what they like, mm -hmm. but they don't know why they like it. They don't know the deeper reason why they like it. Gotcha. See, for example, a gentleman went to other countries and uh, he picked up rubbish mm -hmm. to, from a hurricane. Does he like picking up rubbish? No, that's not the issue. Yeah. Okay. Does he like being wet? No. Does he like the heat? No. There's nothing to do with it. And what it is, is, is his expression of his authentic identity is there and he can express it in a way that makes him happy. Gotcha. So despite the heat and picking right. up trash and despite, you know, being wet and miserable, really he's ultimately fulfilled, not because of the outside circumstances that right, he's exactly. in. But it's because ultimately, at the end of the day, he gets this great satisfaction, like, oh, I helped someone. Yes. I made a difference. Yeah, yes. And even then, uh, you could even go back and say, there's what you want. Mm -hmm. But the question is, why do you want that you want? Yeah. That's why, that's why I discover. Yeah. Why do you want to want? So as long as you can verbalize the first layer. Mm -hmm. But you can only feel the second layer. Mm, gotcha. That's gotcha. What, that's when I assess someone. That's what comes out. That second layer. Gotcha. So so you can ask someone, say, what, what do you like? You know, what do you yeah. like to do? But then the second layer is, and tell me if I'm on the right track. Yeah. Why do you, why do you like to do that? Ah, that, then they'll give me an answer mm -hmm. that is not there yet. Ah, okay. Here, this is how it goes. I say, Kim, do you have a car? Yes. Why do you have a car? So I can get to where I need to go. So people people can walk. Oh, I need to get there quickly and be there 
in an efficient way for my clients. Why don't you live closer? Because I love living out in the country and my clients usually live in the city. <laughs> ah, now see what you just said? I love so, living in the country. <laughs> that's right. So when you land on an archetype, mm -hmm. that is the answer. Gotcha. Gotcha, okay. gotcha. So that's the reason why you have a car. But yes. I've taken some people through that. And in the end, it says, well, gee, I don't know. I just, I just feel like I need a car. And so that's really the answer is I don't know. And then I go one level deeper. Uh, so if you yeah, can verbalize yeah. it, usually it's not it. Usually you're mm -hmm. on the outer edges. And mm -hmm. uh, that's why people have problems, at least my clients do, problems with, uh, say, personality profile tests or, or mm -hmm. reading self-help books. Because mm -hmm. th it's designed to reach a, a mass of people and they mm -hmm. can't afford to focus a book on one person. Right. Make, that makes sense. So in the meantime, these people are spending money and time trying to change themselves or find out what the issue is. Mm -hmm. And they're always getting a one size fits all answer mm -hmm. and that's being missed. Yes. Oh gosh. Let's take a quick break. Uh, after that, let's delve a little bit more into why some of the other uh, one size fits all d don't work. <laughs> all right. Very good. After a quick break, John and Kim will be back with more of Authentic Living, podcast for a better life. you start projects feeling on fire and later on find yourself getting burned out? If so, you are not alone. A recent poll showed that more than 7,500 full-time employees experience burnout. 23% of those workers said that they felt burned out more often than not. I want you to know it is normal to feel burnt out. Cut yourself some slack. In Keeping Your Spark, I empower your project or team members with five surprising ways to keep their spark going, even if they currently feel like a burnt ember. Contact me at kwe at kwepub.com or at 804-536-1972 to book me and reignite your spark. Welcome back to Authentic Living, podcast for a better life. Here's John Voris and Kim Ely. So welcome back. We're excited because we've been talking about authentic systems and also on tickers. And to give you a little insight, I wrote this awesome book called Tickers, What Makes People Tick and Pursue a Career They Love, where I interviewed people from all different walks of life. The thing that they had in common was they absolutely loved what they did for their career. This seemed like a foreign concept to me because I was always raised with work is hard and it's awful and it's drudgery and, and you know, you, you suffer to make money. And I realized I was like, you know, there's some people out there who actually aren't suffering every day. They actually kind of like what they do. And the one size fits all kind of concept, I think sometimes gets thrust upon us by well-meaning people, but people are like, oh, you need to have a safe career that will make money, blah, blah, blah. What I discovered when I talk to people about who really love what they do is I found that they all had in common. They were like, this is what I'm compelled to do. This is what makes me light up. This is what I truly enjoy. So I'll share a story. And John, I think I've shared this with you before, but I, I, I really love this story. I met a woman who runs a traveling cat circus. <laughs> and even cat lovers like me are like, wow, you're on a bus with 30 cats going around the United States. You must really love cats because that's a whole lot of cats in your life all the time. She discovered as she was growing up, she absolutely loved animals. She even had, it was great. She snuck rats into her room. She had secret rats and she would train them and try to keep them a uh, secret. And her parents were horrified, but she absolutely loved animals being around them, was fascinated with how they behaved. When she went to college, her parents really wanted, John, have you ever heard of somebody getting an MRS degree? No. That is your Mrs. degree. That is when you go to college, oh. you marry someone. <laughs> 
so her parents wanted her to get her MRS and she was like, mm, I'm studying animal behavior and I find this fascinating. So she ended up following her passion despite her parents' horror and training with some amazing people and learning all about how to be a fantastic animal trainer. And the thing is, she didn't listen to the one size fits all. She didn't listen to this is, you know, this is what how it has to be. <laughs> So um, I think it's interesting, John, because I remember you had talked about, you know, a lot of people will tell us what we can do and tell us more about. Okay, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, always advertised, especially in, on school grounds, that you can do anything. <laughs> and don't ever tell anybody what you can't do. And they focus <laughs> on this word can. And I understand that. But that's not what makes the world go around or makes people find themselves in your in a book called Tickers. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> so there's what you can do and what you could do. I can be a mortician. Mm -hmm. I have the ability. Mm -hmm. uh, I could do it if there was a school, a mortician school in the area. And the question is, should I do it? Mm -hmm. and maybe the should is I shouldn't really do it because uh, maybe I'm a little queasy about the whole thing. Yikes. Then there's what we must do. Mm -hmm. And people need to follow the must because when you're following the must, you feel as if you have no other choice. Right. You feel as this is all there is in the world for me. And that, and it's true. When mm -hmm. you feel you must do it, all your people in tickers, Mm -hmm. found that they found that must do yes and that's what i uh turn people toward is in their life what is their must do yes and quite often it's against their parents or friends or relatives but they realize it'll make them happy uh, right. i had uh, one uh, young man in his 20s his father was a uh, highway patrolman i think i told you the story and highway patrolman. And so he was going to school, was doing great, third year. And then he started uh, slipping up and getting poor mm. grades. And mm -hmm. he was falling back. And so the father came to me and says, why don't you assess him? I need to know what's going on. So when mm -hmm. I did, he come to find out he was a justice person, but he <laughs> was also a justice person who could not inflict conflict. Oh, gosh. How can you be a higher patrolman and not inflict conflict on the people you're, you're meeting every day? <laughs> right? I don't think that would work. <laughs> no. So he found out that was the reason why he was self-sabotaging. Ah, and then I ask him, you know, if there's some other way you can uh, go. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, yes, I said, there's, uh, well, victimology. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed that because you studied uh, the victim and you study from his, that his point of view. He thought that would be a great thing to do. So he did and went back to school and finished and, and did join uh, the Howie Patrol. And, uh, and he's doing fine. Oh my gosh. So let me ask you that with victimology, I'm guessing there was no conflict, not the way you would, because I would imagine as a highway patrolman, you're pulling people over in their car, giving them a ticket. They're probably all up in your face and very, you're, you're getting a whole lot of conflict on a daily basis. Right. And he worked at a division of the probation department. Oh gosh! So even even worse, yeah. But he was he, the idea was to help others. Ah, gotcha, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. And so. so that was a small town, and he's moved since then. But rather than causing people problems, he was trying to help them. That was the whole point. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So I love that. But how frequently do you see people who succumb to the? other people telling them what to do versus following what they feel they must do. That's an everyday occurrence because most people are not lucky enough to find that when they're young. Mm. So for example, when I was young, my parents thought I spoke well and then the others, I love to argue. And uh, <laughs> so right off the bat, you should be an attorney. Right. <laughs> well, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's what's that got to do? Yeah, that's fine. That's what some attorneys do, but that doesn't mean I should. Maybe I should be a novel writer. Mm, Maybe mm -hmm. I should be a poet. 
<laughs> uh, maybe there's a lot of other things that I could be and uh, maybe work for a newspaper, but they focused on attorney because they made money. At least that's right. what I thought. And so I went to law school. I didn't like it. And I uh, dropped out of that and uh, bought a delicatessen and, and then went back into, into sales, which is how I discovered authentic systems. Right. Because all of the courses I ever took in sales failed because they're all one size fits all. And they really focus on what's called analytic psychology. And I found all my answers you know, from a European perspective mm -hmm. uh, and it worked beautifully. And I cold called door to door for 20 years. Yeah. Wow. So based on that, yeah. That's so amazing. So when somebody sees that you are able to do something, like for instance, John, you're great at speaking and you also like to argue. Those are things that you do, but we've talked about before. That's not who you really are. Those right. are the things you do. Yes. How do you chip to that deeper level below, you know, like you say, you know, beneath somebody's personality because you're bubbly. You know, I hear that a lot. You're bubbly and, and you're a lot of fun is what I hear, but bubbly okay. and fun are not who I am on a fundamental basis or level. Right. That's 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 how I interact with the world. Right, those are your attributes. Attributes, there we go. Right. And, and so attributes don't make decisions. <laughs> right. You don't marry an attribute. <laughs> right. You don't become angry at an attribute. <laughs> and so they're, what it is, they're just describing, actually they're describing your gen genetic composition. Hmm. Oh, you mean the doing, the, the outward, the bubbly. Uh, the bubbly. Like, yeah, because you'll find that one, if you're bubbly, one of your parents or a relative is relatively close also had a, somewhat of a bubbly personality. Interesting. That's usually. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. But doctors, I looked into this, uh, they found that uh, uh, in, in utero, uh, they actually express uh, personality. Ah. Babies, yes, they do. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Wow. So they're not even born yet. So they're not even exposed to any environment. Right. But that's essential. Human beings are given genetic predispositions, mm -hmm. which are more like a foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they, children learn what's fair easily, quickly. Mm -hmm. They're two, three years old. And if you take a cookie away from a baby, what's going to happen? That's, you know, that's not fine. fair. That's right. That's not fair. <laughs> right. And the other, there's a stage when everybody, when, when children want to know everything and they ask questions, mm -hmm. what's this, what's that, what's this, that's that phase. And then in intermingled is the power stage where they want to feel like they can impact the world. Right, right. They can move things. They, they count. So really all four, love, justice, wisdom, and power are being practiced very early because yes. That first comes from the genetic predisposition. Oh, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. So at what point, I guess, because you often will talk with, uh, you know, young people, people who are, you know, going to go into college, things like that. How do you help them to maybe get rid of the messages or climb through the messages that say, you should do this because you're good at this? How, how do you help them kind of shift to a different mindset? I bring their parents. Uh, smart. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have a parent sitting there who wants the best for their children mm -hmm. and uh, had that experience where he wanted his daughter to be an attorney or in real estate. Mm -hmm. And in that process, she, he found that she wanted to be a child psychologist. Ah. And it changed the whole world because now he knows where to devote his money, what college to support, where she'll be. She will follow through with the major because she never wanted mm -hmm. to be a realtor or an attorney and right. she'll follow through the major and everything worked out. Everything works that's, out that way. That's amazing. So with the parent there. Now, sometimes with I'll, the... I'll do couples. Mm -hmm. That works out. Oh, gotcha. Yes. Yeah, gotcha. She knows what he's up to and he knows what she's up to or what, what you know, <laughs> what, what they're like. You know, and so um, right. well, when you assess them in front of the other, then they can either confirm or deny what I'm coming up with or what we're, we're coming up with together. And that makes it really nice because then when it's over with, they, she, she or he sees what really turns them on and gets them motivated. Then when they go right. home, they're backed up. Right. 
Right. Oh, that's fantastic. We're partner in it. Yes. That's awesome. Yes. Goodness. So but keep in mind, all my clients are people who've gone through all these tests and courses and seminars and workshops and, and still felt there's, there was a gap there. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, I, I think we had talked about in the first episode about people in sales who would have training and they might repeat the same training, but yeah. you see that as well with people who will take like personality tests. Sure. So that's so interesting. What do you think when you're revealing to somebody and, and sharing with them their assessment and, and let's say it's a young person and they're there with their parent. Is it a gradual aha process? How do people grasp it? Are they did, are they initially resistant to hearing the assessment results or, or are they kind of on the edge of their seat? Like, wait, what? I never knew this. Well, uh, the, the children, they're open immediately. Mm -hmm. But the parent is, they have all the walls up. Gotcha. And then they start listening to how their child reacts to the questions. Mm. And it's a slow process and suddenly they're on board. With adults, at first they have, the walls are up. And then mm -hmm. as we continue, the walls come down. And <laughs> in the very beginning, they're very talkative. <laughs> then when I say, okay, now do you see this pattern and what you're up to? That you're always looking in at life in a binary way. There's always a, 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 there a, there's a B, there's a B, there's a C. There's always something. Do you see that? And, and then that's when the epiphany happens ah. for a justice person. Right, right. right. And so, um, yeah, so most, uh, it's really, it usually starts within the first 15 minutes. Gotcha. So within the first 15 minutes, that's amazing. Yes. Yes. That's really yes. wild. And then it just continues. Yeah. And then uh, they're just absolutely quiet, uh, just listening, listening. And they're just they're answering questions, but then they're really listening. Right. Different kind of listening. The other is, is every one of, well, very often, probably 80% of my clients, when they're done, uh, they'll say, had I known it was going to be like this, I would have done it earlier. Ah. They're afraid that they're going to find something terrible about themselves. Oh and, wow! You know that. Oh yeah, we're going to find out they're psychologically you're you're impaired in some way. First of all, I'm not in the field of psychiatry, and that's not my issue. I'm dealing with archetypes only, and so it's right. very very safe. Uh, if I say, in fact, I'll ask, uh, describe the last time you were happy. Mm -hmm. It could have been last week. It could have been 10 years ago. It could have been you found a, a parking place. I mean, right. it's, it doesn't matter. It's very simple. Very, It's not intrusive at all. Right, right. But it has a pattern because everything you do reflects your authentic identity. Oh, I love it. So may I share an example where I was incredibly happy last week? Okay. And we can talk about what, because full disclosure, I am a love life theme. I had done the assessment and I absolutely, it, it resonated with me. But last week, John, you would have just been amazed. I went to the American Library Association Conference in Washington, D.C. with 14,000 librarians, publishers, books, as far as the eye could see, it was the size of a football field and a half. Wow. And I felt such euphoria. And I think it was because I was there. I, I love books. Books, words, messages light me up. And I was there with my peeps, with my fellow book lovers. I just felt like I was on seventh heaven. I didn't eat all day on Saturday. And I am a girl who does not like to miss a meal. Uh -huh. And I realized at the end of the day, huh, what's that weird feeling? Oh, that's hunger because yeah. I forgot to eat. I was so excited. So does that resonate with who I am as a love person? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no question about it. Absolutely. I mean, being around people is something that uh, you need yes. and you're always doing. Yes. Uh, so now you're with other people sharing the same type and kind of ideas. And that is very important. Yes. And so that a sense of fulfillment I could see would be there. Yes. yes. Oh, gosh. Yes. I, I was in seventh heaven. I didn't want to leave. 
And I absolutely, it, and I brought home too many books. I, you would have done the same There's thing. No such thing as too many books. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so I have yeah. a T-shirt that says "Hoarding is not if, the, if they're books." <laughs> we go there we go i love it i love it so well this has been fascinating thank you so much for sharing i love getting these deeper insights on why authentic systems enables people to have better and more authentic relationships not only with themselves but with their families sure Mm -hmm. oh yes yeah, they uh, now they really do understand each other, and they're talking on a very different level uh, because they're not being they're they're not making it personal. They're, they really realize that there's archetypes talking to other archetypes. There we go. That's absolutely fascinating. So if you would like to know more, dear listener, about this, please go to John's website. And what is that, John? That's AuthenticSystems.com. Excellent. So check it out. And if you are interested, please reach out to John. And I highly suggest doing an assessment. It truly is life changing. I can say that because I took the assessment and I use it truly all the time for my personal life and business. And if you're interested in tickers, reach out to me at kwepub.com. Oh my gosh. So we'll see you guys next time for our next episode. Now, one more uh, point is they can, they can get a hold of me by john at authentic-systems.com. Excellent. Absolutely. Absolutely. So feel free to drop John an email and oh my gosh, thank you so much, John, for another amazing episode. Well, thank you. Yes, absolutely. This concludes another episode of Authentic Living, podcast for a better life. Thanks for spending time with us. Hope you join us again soon.